So last week we dealt with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. Today we're dealing with an aftermath of the assassination of very different personality. I call this talk, Lyndon Johnson, The Agony of Fixation. You know, there's an old adage attributed to Lyndon Johnson. One thing you better learn uh, if you're going to be in politics is that uh, you never go out in a golf course and beat the president. <laughs> Don Van Natter is a golf historian. In his book, First Off the Tee, a compilation of presidential golf idiosyncrasies, he talks about an amusing golf game between Lyndon B. Johnson when he was, was president and the retired Dwight D. Eisenhower just after he'd uh, left, and LBJ and uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower were diametric opposites, of course. And not only in person, but on the golf course as well. Ike was a military man, fastidious about his golf, like uh, the famous rule here at Taconic Golf Course, no preferred lies, we play golf here. Well, uh, he was fed fastidious about his golf rules, a stickler for the rules, no winter rules, no preferred lies, no gimme putts, not even 12 inches not even 12 inch Kimmy putts, but not so LBJ, says Von Nutter. Lyndon Baines Johnson played golf the way he played politics, by his own rules, at his own pace, and damn the torpedoes. On the fairways and greens, Johnson flattered, cajoled, belittled, and sweet talked the golf ball, same way he uh, did a recalcitrant senator. If the shot didn't go the way he wanted, which is most of the time to the dismay of Ike, Johnson would simply take another ball out of his pocket, hit a mulligan. <laughs> if that didn't go the way he liked, and as an exasperated Ike fume, Johnson would reach in his pocket, take another one, hit it again, let's call it a hula hand. <laughs> and then possibly a McGillicuddy. And then if that didn't work, a Murphy. By this time, Ike was beside himself. But he couldn't do anything. After all, his turn was over. Johnson was president. Two presidents were an hilarious misfit on the golf course. Well, LBJ, however, was a very big guy. And oh, he was uh, wild and gawky. On a very rare occasion, he would uh, connect. And when he did, he hit the ball a ton. On a very long, difficult par 4 18th hole, as I gasped in amazement, Johnson finally strung together two huge, flawless shots and was on the green in two. This is on a long par four. Now the ball was sitting 18 inches from the pin, almost a gimme putt away. Maria Birdie on a very tough par four hole. That vaunted birdie was just within the president's sights when suddenly the Associated Press showed up. Johnson lined up the putt. As a disbelieving Ike looked on, the moment captured by the Associated Press photographer was published the next day in papers throughout the country. In short, LBJ blew it. The New York Times headline, typical of most, read simply, the president messes up a putt. In a sense, that 18th hole was a microcosm of LBJ's presidency. Lyndon Baines Johnson came agonizingly close to becoming one of the most transformational presidents uh, in the 20th century. Yet his presidency, which started out with such unparalleled achievement, ended in flames. He's no longer remembered for his epic-changing Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1965, or the Voting Rights Act, or for his war on poverty. Instead, the only war that has come to define LBJ is Vietnam. The only battles he's remembered for are the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam and the clubbing of hippies and yippies outside the 1968 presidential convention in Chicago. Their crime, well, the poor hippies and yippies had just nominated a pig called Pegasus as their candidate for president. Just months after his administration ended in flames, the Woodstock phenomenon attracted a crowd of over half a million, tying up traffic for miles all the way into New York City. Woodstock spawned the likes of Janis Joplin, Arlo Guthrie, Joan Baez, and of course the haunting music of Bob Dylan, not to mention mud baths, drug culture, free love, flower children. It was all really a vast protest, a testament to the loss of an entire generation of Americans under LBJ's watch. 
Many of those poor kids and their buddies died in a hard death in the unforgiving mosquito-infested swamps of South Vietnam. Many of the rest have never recovered physically or psychologically. None of them have yet to discover where that uh, Bob Dylan's flowers have gone. As a result, in a recent polling of 40 presidents published in 2008, LBJ was ranked near the bottom of the list in nearly every category and dead last in the category of foreign policy. It's a dubious distinction he shared only with Jimmy Carter and James Madison. How this all happened, how the leader with such promise managed to self-destruct. Well, today's story begins in 1908, and it begins on the muddy banks of the Pedernales River in the hill country of central Texas, where Lyndon Baines Johnson, the first child of James and Rebecca Johnson, was born in a two-room shack without indoor plumbing. Pedernales wasn't really a river, true sense of the word, small, muddy tributary of the Colorado, a kind of second-tier phenomenon in a sense. The pathetic, muddy tributary was analogous to the stain of inferiority, uh, which Johnson would fight to overcome all of his life. Throughout his presidency, he was haunted by a feeling that he was inferior to so-called first-tier socialites and intellectuals. It was a flaw that would ultimately lead to tragic consequences, but not only for Johnson. The Johnsons of the Pedernales were often dirt poor, and thus the shortage of money was always a factor in Johnson's early upbringing. When I was young, he remarked, looking back on it, poverty was so common, we didn't know that it had a name. Sam Johnson and Lyndon's mother, Rebecca, were an unlikely pair. Sam was descended from wild, quick-tempered cattle drivers, often made risky bets on the size of their herds. They were tall frontier people with large noses, big ears, thick, bushy black eyebrows, piercing brown eyes, violent tempers to match. LBJ inherited all those characteristics. Rebecca, on the other hand, was to the manor born, daughter of a successful, rather conservative attorney, descended from a long line of Baptist ministers. Grew up in a comparatively large Texas town of Fredericksburg. Rebecca was raised as befitted a southern lady, often dressed in crinoline lace dresses and beribboned hats, wide brims. Developed into a college-educated, soft-spoken, dreamy-eyed young lady. Prized intellectualism, prized literacy, prized poetry. Rebecca was also an idealist and a devout church-going humanitarian. After graduation, she went to work as a journalist for a local newspaper. And while there, she was sent to interview Sam at the Texas legislature in Austin. Well, they discovered they shared a mutual interest in politics, soon fell madly in love. After a whirlwind courtship, Sam returned with his fragile, sensitive bride, Rebecca, uh, to the small two-room, tumble-down shack in the hill country on the banks of the muddy Pedernales. And there, Lyndon was born. It was a bad fit for Rebecca. She was unable to cope. Life was primitive on the banks of the Pedernales. She was alone most of the time, fright and miserable, comparing her existence to living on an island surrounded by a sea of land stranded in a physical and intellectual wasteland. The same conditions obtained in Johnson City when they let her move there. So-called city was in reality a frontier town numbering only 360 inhabitants. Although none of her Johnson City neighbors could read or write, none of them, they were kind people and very well-intentioned. They tried to help her with household things, and Rebecca repaid their kindness by voluntarily teaching both them and their children literacy, poetry, elocution. But it was a very difficult life. Things improved for a number of years while they were in Johnson City. During that time, the cotton crop flourished. Rebecca could afford household help. But when left alone, she was a terrible housekeeper. After she had great difficulty delivering her fourth and fifth children, Rebecca was forced to remain bedridden uh, for a long time. The upkeep of the house spiraled out beyond her control, and these were the good times. Sam was notorious for working his farmhands furiously, but he was respected for working hard right along with him. Both were traits Johnson would emulate. Times were good. Sam strutted a lot, wore fancy handcrafted cowboy boots, 
large Stetson hats, had the only car in town, a Hudson, had himself driven around by a young chauffeur. The articulate, literate, and respected cotton farmer Sam was elected to the Texas legislature for six terms. But drought eventually hit Johnson City. When drought hit, it wiped out Sam's crop. Sam tried desperately to make up his losses by speculating in futures. This only plunged him deeper into debt. Eventually, Sam lost everything. Never recovered. Remained a broken man throughout the remainder of his life, and the family remained poor. When Sam lost his money, Rebecca was without household help. Her house soon looked like something out of Hell's Kitchen. The Johnson children were often literally close to starvation, begging food from neighbors. When times were really bad, her neighbors impoverished as they were often felt called upon to help feed those Johnson children. They did so, but since they scrimped and saved every penny, and she didn't, and since they canned their own food, baked their own bread, scrubbed their own floors, hands and knees, because brooms cost too much, and she didn't, they eventually came to resent her. Although Rebecca gave birth to five children, she cherished her firstborn, Lyndon, above all, keep him in her bed with her when her husband was away. In her eyes, Lyndon could do nothing wrong. She dressed Lyndon in sailor suits, bust her brown outfits, cowboy outfits, complete with wide brim Stetson hats. Little Lyndon didn't resist. Quite the contrary, although he stood out from the other kids at school who all wore jeans and plain farm clothes, he loved the attention it brought him. When there had been money, the Johnsons were deemed pretentious. When they lost it, slid into abject poverty, their neighbor's resentment ultimately turned to ridicule. They became the laughing stock of the town. Lyndon Baines Johnson never forgot. The trauma of his childhood humiliation would leave him with a lack of self-esteem, which even his overbearing persona and crude bluster couldn't hide in times of stress. His father Sam, his idol, had now become disconsolate, often slid into bouts of deep depression. The son who had emulated his father when he was little, even getting all lathered up with him, tending to get a shave with him in the barber chair, often mimicking his gait and his mannerisms now, tragically came to resent him. Lyndon became disobedient, unruly, unmanageable, often bossing his younger children, uh, the younger children to do tasks that had been assigned to him. Lyndon would thus grow up uncontrollable, strong-willed. Being rather gangly and large for his age, he would successfully run away to California. Spend a year there at age 15 in order to distance himself from his now very dysfunctional household. He rapidly become self-sufficient, you know, working numerous laboring jobs. Sheer force of will, worked himself through San Marcos College in southwest Texas. He later became a principal in a small rural Mexican-American school. There in that Mexican-American school, he earned a reputation as a battler, a battler for the rights of his students, the wrong, the racially oppressed, lived among them, bonded with them, just as he bonded with the laboring poor during the struggling, impoverished years in California and elsewhere. The genesis of Johnson's political career stemmed from the same impoverished youth. The Sam Ely Johnson, promising political career at the time, was over. But during Sam's earlier stints in the legislature, young Lyndon would often accompany them there, and on the campaign trail as well. Now Johnson once described his days on the campaign trail with his father to intern Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's the happiest days of my life. In the halls and smoke-filled caucus rooms of the Texas legislature, where he worked for a time as a messenger, Johnson was soon caught up in the ritual, the political banner, barter, deal-making behind closed doors. Loved it. And he absorbed from Sam as if by osmosis the only not only invaluable lessons in the elusive art of compromise, but Sam's mannerisms. And Sam, before his financial debacle, was a hail fellow well and good met, striding down the halls of the legislature, dominating caucus groups, grabbing legislators by their lapels, going nose to nose with them. These were lessons and mannerisms that Sam's son would mimic to great advantage throughout his eminently successful years in Congress later on. In 1935, middle of the Depression, 
FDR created something called the National Youth Administration, the NYA. Now Johnson, with the help of Sam Rayburn, one of the most respected men in Congress, wheedled an appointment as the Texas director of the administration. To do so, however, he had to crowd out a union boss who had not only been appointed to the post, but had already been sworn in. No mean trick. Sam Rayburn was so taken with young Johnson, he had closeted himself with FDR. Johnson's behalf in the previous appointment was remarkably declared a mistake. Johnson was only 26 years of age, and the deafness of the move was a portent of things to come. A brilliant political move by sheer force of will and a mastery of political networking. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the quintessential political opportunist, had now become the youngest director of any New Deal program in the United States. Johnson now distinguished himself by driving his NYA staff unmercifully. But uh, like his father Sam, no less hard than he drove himself. In a severely depressed, jobless depression economy, he succeeded in finding employment and college funding through public works, projects for thousands of unemployed and impoverished young Texans. His efforts in working around obstacles such as government red tape, union rules, and achieving singular results in this regard were soon noticed by FDR through his first lady, Eleanor, when she toured the state as FDR's alter ego, she often did. His tortuous path to the presidency had now begun. Next came a successful run on a special election for the House of Representatives in Texas, in the 10th District, made LBJ the youngest member of Congress. That led to a very successful meeting with FDR himself when the presidential yacht happened to dock in Galveston. He bonded with FDR. FDR liked him. Johnson, ever the consummate political opportunist, deftly nurtured his relationship with FDR. When FDR steered large military contracts to Johnson in Texas, LBJ dutifully arranged for the orders to be filled by the oil and gas conglomerate Brown and Root Incorporated. The conglomerate in turn financed both Texas for Roosevelt and Brown for LBJ campaigns. Brown and Root would become a major backer in Johnson's rise to power in the Senate. He richly rewarded Brown and Root. LBJ, though a mere 32 years of age, thought he was now ready for a Senate campaign, entered the race not long after FDR's third inauguration in April 1941. His opponent was a weasened old Texas politician named Pappy O'Daniel, very popular governor of Texas, at the time affectionately known as Pass the Biscuits Pappy O'Daniel. Our story of Johnson's meteoric rise now hits a formidable bump in the road when Johnson had declared for his Senate run, old Pass the Biscuits had not yet decided to run. No one had expected him to do so. When O'Daniel finally did declare at the last minute, Johnson was so upset that he took to his bed and then to the hospital where he remained for over two weeks. Off the campaign trail. According to Lady Bird, he was depressed and it was very bad. Reminiscent of Sam, but regrettably a foreshadowing of things to come later in his career. Johnson emerged from the hospital, determined to fight and campaigned hard against old Pappy. But then came a lesson in practical politics he would never forget. For Tammany boss uh, Tweed, you may remember in the 1860s and 1870s, the elections in New York began after the balloting was over. Not the balloting that counts, said Tweed, it's the counting that counts. It was after the lights went out the Tweeds of minions performed magical incantations over ballot boxes. Miracles were made to happen. LBJ uh, had won the vote, but had made the rookie mistake disclosing the tiny margin by which he had won the election during a wild victory celebration before he went to sleep. Of course, uh, by the time he woke up, his wily older opponent had raided the ballot boxes which were kept unsealed in various judges' homes. Johnson lost by 1,311 votes. Seems old Pappy knew how to pass more than just biscuits. Johnson was devastated 
But when he told the story, he was patron FDR in the White House in July 1941. FDR reportedly roared back in laughter. Apparently, you Texans haven't learned one of the great lessons we've learned up in New York. And that is, when the election's over, you got to sit on the ballot boxes. <laughs> LBJ duly chastened would now become a master of ballot counting. But he would go FDR one better, as we'll see. Warriors are not particularly uh, kind. Lyndon Johnson spent an undistinguished two years essentially doing administrative tasks as a naval desk jockey uh, since he'd never been to sea and didn't know a bow from stern. But the war finally ended in 1945, and this brings us to the infamous landslide Lyndon campaign. It was a Senate campaign in 1948. Lyndon was only 39, still young for a Senate campaign. In the 1948 elections, Johnson ran in the Democratic primary against another very popular governor of Texas at the time, a man named Coke Stevenson. And winning the Democratic primary in Texas was, that time, tantamount to winning the general election. That time was an all-democratic state. LBJ's campaign workers literally sat on the ballot boxes on election night, and of course, they concealed the interim tallies from the opposition, who had actually outpolled them. But other Johnson partisans were accused of doing much more than that. John Connolly, as campaign manager, produced 202 votes, which were cast six days after the polls closed. One which Lee had been cast in, listen to this, alphabetical order. <laughs> All those neatly alphabetized folks, of course, were eventually found to have been dead on election day. That was only the tip of the iceberg, according to biographer Robert Carroll. Carroll alleges that Johnson stole the election, rigging not thousands of votes, tens of thousands of votes. LBJ had obviously learned more than just what FDR and Pappy had taught him. Notwithstanding all these allegations, Johnson's close friend and attorney, Abe Fortas, was miraculously able to persuade the Texas State Democratic Convention to certify that Johnson had won by 87 votes out of a total of a million cast. He deftly hauled an investigation before a federal mastery in chancery in Texas, which uh, would have no doubt nullified Johnson's win. Closest election ever in the history of Texas. Fortas was later nominated by Johnson to the Supreme Court, served on the court for a while, and was forced to um, resign. And Johnson was henceforth chidingly referred to by his colleagues in the Senate as landslide Lyndon. Uh, but he was there for good. It was old-fashioned, dirty American politics at its very worst that had got him there. The poor boy from the banks of the Perdinalis was now wallowing in the political mud. Once in the Senate, uh, Johnson became a whirlwind. When Johnson strong-armed someone, he would lean into them and spit in their face while talking. A senator once described the Johnson treatment it's like having a St. Bernard licking your face and pawing you all over. <laughs> but it worked. Johnson rose meteorically, came party whip within two years of minority leader within four. By 1956, Johnson had become the youngest ever Senate majority leader at age 46. Although his unparalleled ascent had already given rise to serious talk of a run for presidency, the fates were not kind to Johnson. The spotlight was to be snatched away from him, suddenly, by the newest Democratic flavor of the month, a rich, handsome, charming, father-dominated war hero named John F. Kennedy. Although JFK lost his bid for the vice presidential nomination in 55, with Kennedy, the star was now in the ascendancy. Now, during the next four years, Johnson was thrust back into the second tier just as he was on the brink of being elevated by his party to run for higher office. When Kennedy was finally nominated to run for president four years later, he offered the second tier vice presidential nomination to LBJ as a courtesy, figuring that by the move he would curry favor with the Southern uh, Bloc, although fully expecting that LBJ, majority leader in the Senate, uh, would never accept second place. He was wrong. LBJ knew something that many others didn't, that JFK suffered from Addison's disease, an illness that's often terminal. 
So the Wiley Johnson surprised everyone and accepted the nomination, figuring he had a one in four chance of ascending the office during JFK's term. On the same day that JFK made the offer to Johnson in the same hotel, brother Bobby Kennedy met with Johnson, tried to talk him out of accepting. Johnson refused. Bobby and LBJ would remain mortal enemies, mortal enemies for the remainder of their lives. There were ramifications. The enmity would significantly affect LBJ's role in the vice presidency and as a result, indirectly, his Vietnam strategy as well. When Kennedy won, LBJ succeeded to the office, just vacated by his nemesis, Richard Nixon, of course, suffered pretty much the same fate that Nixon had under Eisenhower, ignored, relegated to the back bench, rarely if ever met with the president, whose brother Bobby, of course, had become JFK's principal advisor, confidant, attorney general. LBJ was now to languish for almost three years in political no man's land. He met with Kennedy only one-on-one -on -one for only two hours uh, during his 1,000 days as vice president. Even Truman had met with FDR more than that in the less than two months he, he was vice president. Though Kennedy had announced it as inaugural that the torch had been passed to a new generation of Americans, Johnson correctly felt that didn't include him. He felt eclipsed, useless, powerless. Robert Kennedy sneeringly referred to him as Rufus Cornbone, a Texas oaf. Johnson himself would moan, the vice president's a steer. You know what a steer is? The steer is a bull who has lost his social standing. <laughs> By the fall of 1963, Johnson was a forgotten man. So much so that an article in the Texas Observer was entitled, What is an LBJ? reported that comedians were having a field day with Johnson's obscurity. Random sample of Americans polled on candid camera, remember that program? Asked what, who was Lyndon Johnson? Listed, elicited responses such as, don't know him, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> Why not try the phone book? When disaster struck on November 22, 1963, Lyndon Baines Johnson with his hand on a Bible standing alongside a trembling, blood-stained Jacqueline Kennedy on Air Force One, sworn in as the 36th president of a shocked, incredulous, grieving USA. The succession to ultimate power hadn't happened the way he figured it would, but from the poverty and humiliation of the Peronalis, Sam Johnson's firstborn Lyndon had now reached the pinnacle of power, the holy grail that had been denied him. As president, LBJ would now endeavor to marshal his legislative leadership strengths to the end of governing from the executive office. The policy decisions were now his to make, and he often made them regardless of the consensus of his congressional leadership. When his close friend, Senator Richard Russell, for example, resisted joining the Warren Commission, investigating the assassination of uh, Pre uh, President Kennedy, Johnson simply told him point blank, Dick, I can't arrest you, and I'm not going to put the FBI on you. But you're damn sure going to serve. I'll tell you that. Russell joined the Warren Commission and served to the end. You didn't say no to Lyndon Johnson. Well, why then was passing civil rights legislation his first priority upon reaching the elusive presidency? Historians Robert Dalek, Robert Caro, James Dave Barber, all agree that there was beneath all the bluster the redneck crudeness and the despotic manipulating and underlying humanitarianism, born of his desperation as a youth. I feel his mother Rebecca's idealistic humanitarianism uh, was an unheralded part of that admixture as well. But every motivation, when these initiatives came at the outset of his administration, they came in a frenetic adrenal rush, a rush that paralleled in intensity that of FDR uh, in 1933, during the first hundred days, a Camelot whirlwind of the early 1960s. The immense international tragedy of Vietnam that followed his great society program, Civil Rights, then makes of this man a fascinating but immensely complex and paradoxical study. So complex and paradoxical that noted historian Robert Carroll, a great historian, <coughs> 
has devoted the last 30 years of his life to deciphering him. And Caro's still at it, heading now to Vietnam to research his final volume. Well, the initial foray into Vietnam was a Kennedy initiative on which LBJ as vice president had not been consulted. He did not sit in the coveted councils of Camelot beside Brother Bobby, Dean Rusk, McGeorge Bundy, Walt Roscoe, all of Harvard, or Robert McNamara, former president of the Ford Motor Company. LBJ had inherited these luminaries from the assassinated Kennedy, and he kept them. Why didn't he drop them? Interesting question. For one thing, inasmuch as Vietnam was an issue on which he was fearfully aware of his ignorance, and in which he felt second tier, he opted almost reverentially to defer to the very advisors who had been Kennedy's key players. But I'm convinced that there was something much more at work here. They had also been part of an imagined higher, more refined social and intellectual order than he was. They were part of a circle heretofore allowed only to a Camelot-like elite, who wanted higher intellect, one of social standing, a circle into which a he, Rufus Cornpone, the Texas oaf, the raw, humiliated, deprived boy from the muddy banks of the Pedernales would now at long last compel his own entry. Why? Because he could. It was as if he were being propelled forward by an intense psychodrama by an incomprehensible force, a deus ex machina beyond his control. This choice of advisors then when combined with two other factors. First, a political predisposition derived from his years in Congress. And second, two fatal character flaws provided a deadly mix for both Johnson and unfortunately for our nation. But what was the political predisposition work here? Well, that's one we've encountered before during these talks, soft on communism issue, a fixation with it. Landside Linden had a front row seat as Truman was vilified by McCarthy, McCarran as soft on communism. Johnson watched intently as Mao conquered mainland China and the Alger Hiss affair exploded onto the front pages all on Truman's watch, viscerally aware of the susceptibility of democratic leaders, in particular to McCarthy, like attacks from the right. So it was <clears throat> late in November 1963, immediately after the eulogy for President Kennedy, with tears still running down his cheeks, Johnson met with Henry Cabot Lodge, then ambassador to South Vietnam, and in response to Lodge's informing him that decisions were gonna have to be made regarding our further involvement in Vietnam, he said, I'm not going to lose Vietnam. I'm not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go all the way China went. This unbending stand would become an obsession. But why? For one, as we've seen, LBJ now interfaced daily with the very advisors who had counseled our initial forays into Vietnam. Under Kennedy, all denizens of the domino theory. None would ever advise LBJ of Kennedy's secret meeting with a select group of XCOM members authorizing Robert, uh, Brother Bobby to offer up our Turkish missiles as the quid pro quo that Khrushchev sought. LBJ was convinced that John F. Kennedy's strategy of toughing it out with Khrushchev had carried the day and made of Kennedy a national hero, the hero that LBJ so desperately wanted to be, LBJ from the muddy banks of the Pedernales. So he would tough it out too. So much for the political predilection. Well, what then were the two serious personality flaws I've alluded to? They were first, his inability to countenance dissent. And secondly, his inability to change course radically when circumstances mandated change. First, his inability to countenance dissent. Robert Caro describes Johnson's management style early on as a director of the Texas NYA, National Youth Administration. Johnson made sure that his staff were persons who were willing to take orders and curses without resentment, to be humiliated in front of friends, fellow workers, 
See their opinions and suggestions given short shrift. Carol observed that the psyche of the son of ridiculed parents had been rubbed so raw on the paternalis that to him disagreement was disrespect. So that anything less than total agreement burned like salt in his wounds. Many a truth is said in jest. Johnson is reported to have joked once, when things haven't gone well for you, call in a secretary or a staff man, chew them out. You'll feel better, and they'll appreciate the attention. Consider this. Two NYA staff members, members William Deason and Ellie Jones, were coerced into renting the spare room in Johnson's house so that they could work long hours into the night, 24-7 under his watchful eye. But as they would observe firsthand, Johnson's humiliating treatment of them was not unlike his treatment of his own wife at the time, Lady Bird. When he was single, Johnson had courted her in a full court press after learning that she was the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in the state of Texas. He even proposed to her on her first date. She thought it was a joke, but he never let up until she surrendered. They eloped. But immediately after they did, he began to treat her just as he had treated his subordinates oppressively, tyrannizing, demeaning her in front of friends, acquaintances, turning her into a sort of house slave. Deason and Jones were awkwardly present to confer with Johnson when he awoke and found that he was served coffee and newspapers in bed by Lady, Lady Bird, who had dutifully laid out his clothes, filled his lighter, filled his pen, shined his shoes the night before. If you could not countenance dissent then, how had he succeeded in the Senate? Ironically, his success in the Senate had derived from management skills far different from those required in the Oval Office. In the Senate, his leadership depended on his talent for mediation. That required raw material, actors with great initial preferences. In other words, in order to have the raw material to mediate, he had to have people that had significant views that initiated those views. In the Senate, LBJ was seldom the initiator of legislative moves. He drew together the commitments of others, but this left a void. And it was one which he was unable to fill in the foreign policy sphere, unfortunately. As chief executive, LBJ was expected to lead on civil rights and war and poverty. There he needed no, pro no advisory. That was a legislative fight he was uniquely qualified to lead. But he found his role in the foreign policy arena a good deal more demanding. All you fellows must be prudent about what you encourage me to go for, he would say to his advisors. Tragically, Johnson recognized too late that his reverence for the erstwhile luminaries of Camelot had been misplaced, but his personality flaw had already compounded his mistake. Referring back to his days with the NYA, he had progressively eliminated dissent among his advisors. And then, as he had in the Senate, he tried to mediate. But by the time he was merely mediating among a nest of Vietnam hawks. It had been an effective technique as Senate Majority Leader. Lamentably, it was a fatal flawed technique as Chief Executive. By contrast, Last week we saw the JFK, inherently a dove, nonetheless retained the War Hawks in XCOM, his brother possibly among them. But having duly considered their counsel, he stood up against them and finally bypassed them. Our nation survived the missile crisis. Johnson ultimately countenanced only the War Hawks in his inner circle. We failed in Vietnam. In a very recent book by Robert Dalek, marvelous writer, called Camelot Court. Says Kennedy said in analyzing uh, his staff, the last thing I want is a mutual admiration society. When I see you people stop arguing, that's when I start worrying. That's the difference between the two, the major difference. What then of the other quality that's essential for greatness, namely the capacity to alter course radically? Capacity to alter course radically, very difficult thing when circumstances mandate change. Its absence proved catastrophic for Johnson. 
The eminent historian James McGregor Burns, right here at Williams College, divided the elements of presidential leadership into two categories. First, transactional leadership, meaning managing the administrative duties of the presidency. Two, transformational leadership, changing the culture, the economy, the politics of the country. Abraham Lincoln, for example, possessed both qualities, an all too rare occurrence in a president. Lincoln ranks first in a recent poll of our most admired presidents. Jimmy Carter has been called by some cynics as the Edsel in the White House, perhaps was perhaps the quintessential transactional leader. That is one obsessed with the administrative minutiae for the office to the detriment of his presidency. Carter correspondingly ranks in the same poll near the bottom of that same group of presidents. A transformational president, however, be he liberal or conservative, must know how to deal with the dynamic of constantly changing circumstances. Johnson's inelasticity with regard to Vietnam then was the final material factor in Johnson's tragic descent into the quagmire. Well, Johnson was not the first such president in our history. There are other poignant examples of presidential rigidity. As we've seen in, uh, in this course, Woodrow Wilson's inability to deal with the modifications required to assure ratification of the League of Nations doomed U.S. membership and the League eventually failed. Who then among the presidents successfully managed change? Again, Abraham Lincoln. According to historian David Barber, he's a example, classic example of a leader successfully managing change. Initially, Lincoln stated the Civil War was being fought to preserve the Union. But later, under altered circumstances, he inspiringly changed the Casas Belli to emancipation to the Holy Crusade to free the slaves, complete the American Revolution. FDR was another master changing course. During the Great Depression, FDR had changed course many, many times. Within the New Deal, he did so, but he also did so with neutrality policy. As we saw just last week, John F. Kennedy's initial inclination to bomb the missile sites in Cuba and the temptation to do so climbed exponentially over the 13 days in October 1962. So that was his initial inclination, bomb the missile sites, but he held off. And as the problem became exponentially worse, uh, it became almost unbearable when Anderson's U-2 was shot down. But JFK nonetheless held fire. He drastically changed course by countermanding his own order to bomb the missile sites. He did so in the face of a hard-charging, cigar-chomping Curtis LeMay, and in so doing, may well have changed the course of history. Lyndon Johnson, no doubt, had the opportunity to become a major transformational president. But his tearful pledge given to Ambassador Lodge became a deadly E-Day fix and a death penalty for tens of thousands. The result was an incremental increase in the number of men in Vietnam by 2,500% to more than 535,000. An expenditure of $30 billion a year, mounting casualties, years of bombing, millions made homeless, whole villages destroyed, tens of thousands killed and maimed. All in support of revolving corrupt military dictatorships in South Vietnam. One of those revolving dictators, Nguyen Van Q, the little man with a mustache was quoted as saying, people ask me who my heroes are, I have only one, Adolf Hitler. It's the wrong war. Wrong place, wrong cause, but Johnson persisted, agonizingly fixated, tragically unshakable. On the home front, Johnson had begun to lie to the American people. Although in the summer of 1964, he was already committed to enlarging our presence in Vietnam on August 29th of that year, campaigning against Barry Goldwater, a war hawk, he exclaimed, I haven't chosen to enlarge the war. Goldwater, who admittedly favored stepping up uh, our involvement in the war, uh, countered with a campaign slogan, in your heart, you know he's right. Johnson facetiously countered with, in your guts, you know he's nuts. <laughs> and then he aired arguably the most famous commercial ever made. Remember it? 
You remember the little girl picking the petals off the daisy and counting down to an atomic explosion? Sure you do. Powerful, powerful stuff. LBJ convinced the public that Goldwater was a warmonger who had started nuclear war in Vietnam. The message took. Johnson won in a landslide, garnering a popular margin uh, even larger than that of his idol FDR over Landon, Alf Landon, in 1936. But in the summer of 1964, while that commercial was airing, while LBJ was campaigning, his topmost advisors had already been working for over half a year to expand the war exponentially, as the Pentagon Papers later leaked in 1971 by Daniel Ellsberg would reveal. As casualties continued to mount, the nation and the media were becoming more skeptical of their president. He would excommunicate reporters when they wrote something critical of his politics. Said Johnson, the fact that a man's a newspaper reporter is evidence of some flaw of character. If one morning I walked on top of the water across the Potomac, the headline that afternoon would read, President Can't Swim. <laughs> Press retaliated by sarcastically depicting the chief executive as the first president since Roosevelt, who enjoyed pulling the wings off flies and lifting beagles by the ears. My most vivid recollection of Lyndon Johnson, actually, a picture of him holding a poor Snoopy dog up by its ears. That widely circulated photo presented him as a reckless boor, a crude redneck, indeed, a Rufus Cornpone. An image which stood out in stark contrast to that of his urbane, sophisticated predecessor from Camelot. And certainly did not endear him to the millions of voters like me who religiously followed Charlie Brown and his lovable Beagle Snoopy every day in the comics. As he continued to lie, the phrase credibility gap now crept into our lexicon, and a story possibly more apocryphal than true circulated among reporters at the time. It seems that a neophyte reporter at a Johnson press conference asked a veteran, well, how do you know when he's not telling the truth? The veteran replied, when you see him scratch his chin, not then. When you see him pull on his left ear lobe, not then. When you see him roll his eyes, not then. When you see him open his mouth, then. <laughs> WJ's vulnerability to depression and related physical ailments when he was under severe stress, which surfaced as early as the Papio Daniel campaign, surfaced again, but now on steroids. And now the stakes were much higher. In July 1965, as Johnson dramatically increased American ground forces in Vietnam, he privately told his press secretary, Bill Moyers, I'm very depressed about it. I don't believe the North Vietnamese are ever going to quit. It was as if he was uncontrollably hurling himself and the country down a bottomless pit, but he couldn't stop himself. That same July, Bill Moyers recounted, LBJ knew that his decision to send large numbers of ground troops into Vietnam would likely mean the end of his presidency. It was a pronounced, prolonged depression. He would just go well within himself, just disappear, morose, self-pitying, angry. <clears throat> he was a tormented man. Moyers then goes on to tell of a shocking episode. One day lying in his bed, with the covers almost over his head, Johnson told me that he in fact felt as, as if he was in a Louisiana swamp that was pulling him down. Moyers was so troubled by his interview uh, with uh, LBJ hiding under the covers. <clears throat> and then he went to see Lady Bird only to learn she herself was even more concerned because she had um, seen this more routinely, regularly exposed to this. Severe bouts of depression, withdrawal. As matters in Vietnam continued to worsen, LBJ increasingly personalized his so-called mission it was as if it had become his personal war, not only our country's war. His references to Vietnam were now increasingly given in the first person. I am not going to be the president who sat back and let Vietnam go the way China did. 
pointed, although perhaps subliminal, allusion to Truman's bete noir. I am not going to lose Vietnam. By 1965, Johnson was already referring to my troops, my State Department, my Security Council, excuse himself from dinner, but then I've got to go to Da Nang. When the Viet Cong attacked, they attacked him. He would now routinely have himself awakened at 3 a.m. to be given the latest casualty reports. None were good. As this trend increased, both his mental and physical health deteriorated apace. He became increasingly paranoid. Queeg-like, he would rant, I am the loneliest person in the world, and then significantly reflecting his profound feelings of inadequacy and Camelot envy. I'll never get credit for anything I do in foreign policy, no matter how successful, because I didn't go to Harvard. He would wonder aloud, why is it people like Jack Kennedy? <laughs> he said, why don't people like me? He was extraordinarily sensitive to slurs by all the overbred smart Alex who live in Georgetown, think Harvard. And he wondered continually about his adequacy to be what he so desperately wanted to be, a great president. Things continued to worsen. Casually, lists continued to mount. Finally, in the spring of 67, when even Robert McNamara began to realize the dimensions of the tragedy they had all wrought, LBJ turned on McNamara himself. And he even began to excoriate the likes of Senator William Fulbright, Mike Mansfield, Pope in Rome. I can't trust anybody, he would lament. Everybody is trying to cut me down. LBJ's actions were now entirely unpredictable. He was living almost entirely in a world of illusion, rigidly tethered to an unreachable goal. The agony of LBJ's rigid pursuit of the Viet Cong led to the loss of Johnson's emotional stability, his place in history, and into our national nightmare. Vietnam had not actually become that Louisiana swamp, pulling him down as he hid terrified beneath the covers. Mercifully, following intensive consultation with the venerable Clark Clifford, and while declaring a cessation of the bombing in Vietnam, on March 31, 1968, Johnson pathetically and now famously announced to the nation, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. After leaving the White House, Johnson deteriorated noticeably, smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, ate obsessively, gained far too much weight, ironically grew his hair long like the very hippies he had so detested. By 1968, when Henry Kissinger, Nixon's national security advisor, arrived at Johnson's ranch to brief him as a courtesy on national security affairs, Johnson had lost his moorings. He thought Kissinger was the ambassador from Germany. <laughs> Kissinger's judgment was simply, he's crazy. LBJ lived on for only four years after leaving office, and sadly, he was not long mourned, especially by the denizens of Woodstock. If Shakespeare were alive today, Johnson would no doubt have already become the protagonist of a great Shakespearean tragedy. Great civil rights leader brought down by hubris in the endless swamp of Vietnam. So the leadership qualities that had marked LBJ's success in the Senate were regrettably not the skills demanded of the Oval Office. His intolerance of dissent, his fear that criticism was disrespect, spawned on the muddy banks of that second-tier tributary, the Paternalis. His fixation with the soft on communism boogeyman, which had plagued the Truman presidency and Democrats thereafter. His misconceptions after having been excluded from Kennedy's inner circle during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And finally, his marked inability to change when change was clearly mandated had altogether proved a lethal mix. Lyndon Baines Johnson had failed on the edge of greatness. Just as he had faltered only a short putt away from carding an elusive birdie on that very tough 18th hole, while the Associated Press and an incredulous Dwight D. Eisenhower looked on. <laughs> 
Tragically, this time Lyndon Baines Johnson had taken an entire nation of Americans along with him. Who was it that said golf is just a game? Thank you.